This is a Digital Music Trends coverage of South by Southwest 2013 and it's a pleasure to have here uh, Matt Ho from the company Livestream. He's a Senior Director of Business Development and Head of uh, Music Content. So hi Matt, it's great to have you on the show. How's it going today? It's good. Thanks Andrew. Nice to uh, be here. And uh, thanks for making it at uh, 9 a.m. It's a pretty early session. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's talk about uh, Livestream. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, when you joined the company, and uh, and uh, did you start out as uh, working in music right away? Yeah, so I joined Livestream about two years ago now. Um, I did start out working in in the music uh, in the music vertical. Um, my background before that was working for another competitor, running their music team, and then prior to that, working at uh, record labels and music publishers. So I come from a music team, and it was really trying to leverage, so, you know, from a music background and trying to leverage some of those contacts to help generate content on the Livestream platform. That's great. And uh, so talking about uh, live stream, you have a h huge uh, spectrum of people that, that can use uh, the live stream service. Uh, so let's start with the sort of the, the more you know, basic uses of the platform just to cater for bands that maybe are watching this and may want, be wanting to use it for, for, for their own stuff. So at the very basic level, how, how can musicians and bands use live stream to enhance the relationship with their fans? Sure, so we have a number of different options for a number of different consumers, as you said. Um, and we've tried to rethink over the last year or so the way that our pricing is structured to cater to all of those people. Um, prior to the beginning of 2012, Livestream was set up very similarly to a lot of the other competitors in the space where costs associated with live streaming were based around a uh, number of viewer, uh, viewer hours consumed. Um, which was very hard to predict, and then uh, was either advertising based, so pre rolls running in the content, or you would have to pay a monthly fee to remove that. We've kind of reworked all of those pricing models over the last year or so. So we actually have three basic options, just trying to simplify it for our customers. We have a free to broadcast option, which is ideal for you know for many of our users who don't have a budget at all. Um, so it's free to broadcast. Um, it's ad free, so you're not being bombarded with cheap beer ads in the middle of your broadcast and something that you might not want to align yourself with. Um, the limitations in terms of functionality to that is that it, the content can only live live on the live stream platform. Yeah. And so your viewers, you're basically directing to your channel page and what they actually have to do to be able to view it, you know, for you to not have to pay a fee, is that they have to create their own live stream account or sign in through Facebook. So. We're not making any money from the broadcast, but what we are getting is viewer data essentially and learning about you, know, learning about you, learning about your audience and being able to hopefully build a uh, consistent business. Then the middle tier is $49 a month. Um, that's no sign in. So again, it's still exclusive on the platform, but you can tweet out or promote your channel URL. A viewer comes in and watches it and they can do that passively without doing anything. So no sign in, um, no creating of accounts. Um, but obviously there is a charge then on your end. And then the top tier is $3.99 a month. If you sign a year contract, it's $3.33. Um, that again, passive viewing, it enables you to take that player, to take our player or essentially our entire event page and put that anywhere on the web. So completely uh, embeddable. So um, that's the mo you know, those are the three basic plans. We think it's simplified the, the landscape um, for uh, music partners and for partners in a number of different verticals. Um, and as I said, the most basic one being zero dollars and no advertising. So great with people with low budgets and you can use our very basic, you know, encoding software, um, which is also free of charge to, you know, to be able to encode your, your content from your computer. Yeah, yeah sure. And uh, um, so this is also the most basic tier, of course, and a lot of uh, musicians in their bedroom streaming live. There's, there's, you know, there's a huge market for that. And, uh, and moving on to the sort of a middle ground where we're looking at, for example, venues that are looking at doing live streams and uh, probably need some specific hardware to, to go with that. Uh, um, what, would, what would you say that they can do with the live stream platform and, and how, do, uh, how does it work in terms of both uh, the, the way you record the videos and also like in terms of the portability of the videos themselves in case the venues wanted to put those videos on YouTube or, or do something else with them? Well, to think about it from a, a venue standpoint, which is something that we've been particularly active with, um, over the last few years, we've actually done partnerships with people like the Knitting Factories across the US, um, Viper Room in LA, Joe's Pub in New York, places like that. Um, so we would stream regularly from these, from these venues. You have to kind of think about it backwards. The first hurdle to always overcome is internet connection at the venue. So always ensuring that you've got sufficient bandwidth because that's very much going to affect you know, the quality of the broadcast and you know, to some extent you know, your production setup and, you know, and how, you're, how you're pushing that content out. Um, so 
one of the things that differs with Livestream and many of our other competitors is we have our own, our own proprietary encoding software that we've built from the ground up. Um, so that is available, as I said, to download from our website, and you can use that to encode the, uh, the live video that's coming through from you know, your cameras or even from a rudimentary laptop or webcam, etc. That's pretty straightforward. If you want to be pushing out in multiple qualities, um, so you know, pushing out HD, high, medium, low, uh, you sometimes need additional hardware. We've just moved in the last year or so into that market as well, so we now have a couple of different hardware uh, encoding options on the market. One is what we call the broadcaster, which is very good for people. It's a very good entry level product, um, about $380, $400, I believe. And you can basically fit that to the hot shoe of a video camera and connect wirelessly, whether it's through Wi-Fi at a venue, if you've got a good enough connection there. Um, you can plug in a 4G card if you want to try and push through the 4G cellular networks. And that basically does all of the encoding for you um, without a computer. So that's, you know, that's very, very simple and very low cost. Um, then on the top end, we've released something called the HD500, which runs um, at around $9,000, I believe. And that's a lot more full in terms of functionality. It's a portable computer, essentially. You can do multiple camera switching and encoding live through that device. Um, but, you know, as per the price tag, it's a bit more expensive and, you know, um, is aimed at the higher end, the more professional producer. And then in terms of portability of files, we give you the ability, obviously, to save the files. You know, we always recommend our producers save files locally, um, just in case there's ever any problems on the back end um, in the cloud and you, know, and you can't recover your files, which is very rare. But we always recommend that you record it locally. Yeah, it's always uh, 9.9. Exactly, exactly. You can never say you know, 100% and that 0.1% when, you know, when people lose their files, it's obviously extremely upsetting. And uh, it is a very, very rare instance, but we always recommend record the files locally, and we retain no ownership over anything that's streamed on our platform. So if you're recording from your club, if you're recording from your music venue, if you're recording from your bedroom, we recommend and we will help you work through the flow. So you're recording locally, you can take those files, upload it to YouTube, do whatever you want with it. Um, we also have a very robust VOD platform and infrastructure ourselves. So you can then, you know, um, you can stream live, save it to your channel, and then take the embed codes and distribute it through our VOD player as well. But um, yeah, portability is key. We know our partners want to be able to put this where their viewers live and where they have existing presences online, and that might not, not necessarily just be limited to the live stream platform. And talking about uh, musicians that, uh, you know, a lot of musicians that are, are huge, you know, or, or bigger, bigger venues are using live stream and, of course, driving a lot of views. Uh, so, but I want to hear about the story. What's the story behind maybe musicians that don't start out with a large audience and maybe start building one through live stream? Sure. Um, so that's been one of the big focuses for us over the past year or so. Uh, we are finding the way, obviously we don't just cater to musicians, we have events and uh, producers and broadcasters from a number of different walks of life, but we are finding across the board, music, film, TV, technology, etc. Um, there was a very high bounce rate on, the, on our, not just our platform, but live streaming in general. You would get an artist who would maybe do a live broadcast, promote you know, their channel URL, um, excuse me, the majority of those viewers would never come back again to the platform. So, um, so we've been focused really on trying to learn more about those viewers, get data on you know, how we can re-message them when their favorite artists or when even you know, similar artists and you know, similar interests are going live and get them to be a recurring, you know, a recurring audience. So we have tools, if you're an artist and you know, you're starting off without a big following. I mean, we had Bon Jovi go live last Saturday. Those are, you know, those are the rare sort of, you know, top 1% of artists where, you know, they go live with a day or two's promotion and they get, you know, hundreds of thousands of people tuning in. Most people are having to build it up their, you know, their audience base online um, and in the live video space. So we believe we provide good tools to do that. If you, if you are doing your, a broadcast from your bedroom, let's just say, and you're wanting to do an interactive web chat or you're wanting to perform in front of camera for your fans, um, as I said, depending on the type of plan, if you've got the middle tier plan even, your viewers can watch it passively without doing anything. If they want to share or interact, if they want to send questions to you, then they do need to sign in, um, you know, create an account with their email or with Facebook. So we're learning about them then, we're encouraging them to follow your channel. So then every time you go live, we're sending them email updates saying, you know, uh, Andrea has scheduled a new broadcast in a week's time. And then when you're going live, it'll be Andrea is going live. 
and you know by that through those sort of messaging tools you're hoping to build a consistent you know fan base a consistent audience space that you can then you know build on top of that and then we uh, taking a look at our channel page design as well it's not just live video it's kind of uh, more live event blogging at this point where you can be posting photos you can be posting uh, text updates into the page and into the experience so calls to action if you're if you're a band and you're wanting to sell concert tickets you know you can be dropping in under the player um, you know hyperlinks to whoever's selling your tickets or even you know if you're doing it yourself to your own website to mailing lists etc and trying to drive that audience base away from the live video and to, you know to other things that you might be trying to focus on too so Long, long story short, but yeah, you can, you know, we have the tools to re-engage viewers regularly and get them to come back to all of the broadcasts you do rather than losing, you know, 70, 80% of them every broadcast. And then, you know, we have the ability to help you engage and drive those viewers to other areas that are important to you, whether it's, you know, downloading a new track, whether it's buying a ticket, whether it's signing up to a mailing list, etc. Of course, and, and uh, so on the live stream side, there are, it feels like there are two two sides to the, to the, to the company in the sense that on the one side you have the the services uh, side, which is you know the software, the, the the live streaming service, the hardware that you've been concentrating on for the last uh, uh, 12 months or so, and uh, on the other side you also have like a very powerful platform that uh, I assume you, you want to grow and you want to make it a destination for people to go, not just to when there is a specific broadcast of an artist that they might want to see, but just see like almost like a you know, a TV channel where people go, oh, I wonder what's on live stream right now and, and I'm going to go and check out something and see if there's anything interesting that I, I want to watch. Is that something that, I guess, you know, like, makes sense? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's one of the big challenges with live at the moment. If you think about the way that VOD platforms work versus live, the appointment-based viewing versus the availability anytime, um, building your audience and building your, um, building your platform out is very different. Um, we feel, and obviously a lot of other companies do as well, that there is a great deal of potential in the live space. Yeah. Even companies like ourselves, um, you know, and our main competitors like YouTube Live, etc., we're scratching the surface of the available live content that is out there right now. I mean, you just take a look around here at Austin and South by Southwest, hundreds and hundreds of shows, panels, you know, talks, uh, barbecues, whatever, like live events that fans and people from around the world want to tune into but you know a fraction of them are maybe streaming live or putting this content up online so we feel like there's a big opportunity there um, so yeah at core what we're trying to do is figure out how to best uh, develop our platform yeah. so that people stop coming in and tuning in like you know once or twice to their favorite bands broadcast but start thinking of live stream as a place to come and browse live content yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, that's accurate what we what you said. We're trying to build a destination. We're a technology company first and foremost. So we're trying to build a platform that people want to come back to and discover live content. Um, and we realize that, you know, one of the best ways to do that is to create tools, whether it's, you know, uh, software or hardware that enable people to get their content very low cost and very like high quality online. And then the more, you know, the more live content we can build up there and the more that people have to come back to visit, you know, artist one two and three yeah. then you know hopefully uh, we're gonna you know we're gonna be creating hooks that encourage them to come back and browse for more similar content in you know in their interest likes of course so uh, and uh, along those lines so do, uh, do you think there's a there's a, a way for example to create some sort of uh, scheduling system or or even channels where you would be able to stack up live streams that are in the same category if there are different times to create some sort of continuity stream if, if people like were interested in, in, in that kind of thing? Or do, do you prefer to keep the channel separate um, and, and let users choose exactly what they want to watch? Yes, yeah, so we're very much trying to build live stream around, you know, uh, kind of on the social grid around live. So I mean, that's one of the big things we're trying to do. So we encourage a user, if you come and tune in to watch a band, um, and you want to, as I said, either the band has a free account, so you're having to log in to watch, or you know, you're wanting to interact with the content and you therefore have to create an account or sign in through Facebook. During that sign up flow, we're encouraging you to tell us what your likes are. You know, are you into music, are you into fashion, etc. And we will then, when you go to your, you know, your live stream homepage every time, there's a grid of content that A channels that you have consciously followed. So, you know, your favorite artists. So we will say, you know, coming up from channels you follow and it shows you broadcasts that have been scheduled by those artists. But then we will also show you underneath things we think you might like based on your interests um, and based on what you've explicitly told us during the sign-up process. And we're putting that in front of you. So if you come to livestream.com, 
you're seeing a schedule for the next week or two of you know things that we think you're going to like and you know the big quest for us is trying to get better at that and trying to tailor that more and more to the individual and you know that's no small feat but I think we're doing a pretty good job of it um, compared to anyone else out there in our space right now but it really is being able to you know being able to build a schedule of content as you said we learn more and more about you every time you come into our platform and tune into content and therefore being able to tell you well we think this will be more interesting and make that uh, that suggestion as relevant as possible you know very much like uh, you know Netflix does when you know when you tune in and Netflix uh, you know are trying to you know are trying to tailor their offering to you specifically yeah. and as they've said you know the idea being that ultimately they're saying you know they're only offering you one piece of content because they know you so well that they know like the most relevant thing that um, you know that you're going to want to watch so that's kind of the route that we're trying to go down yeah. and I think we've done a very good job so far of developing that to a point that none of our competitors have yeah uh, mobile so uh, of course uh, like with cameras that you know the iPhone is probably like the most popular camera uh, to shoot photos from on Flickr and a number of other platforms and uh, is that the same thing with uh, with live stream in terms of uh, you know, the low end users do they use mostly their mobile devices to create the streams or is there another type of device that might be more popular on that um, mobile devices are definitely popular and definitely growing uh, I wouldn't say the majority of content on our platform was generated by mobile devices um, we very much historically tended to target uh, mid-level and professional broadcasters. We want the best content on our platform to attract as many viewers as possible. So I think, you know, still the vast majority of it comes through, you know, computers running our software or, you know, high-end production setups. 4G was kind of a big watershed for us. Up until, you know, the launch of, you know, uh, certainly in North America, AT&T, Verizon, etc., moving, you know, more wholeheartedly into 4G, we'd been uh, a little bearish on the mobile broadcast market. We felt that you know broadcasting through your iPhone on a 3G network didn't give a sufficient quality of broadcast and content for viewers to watch, um, and we didn't want to create or enable our partners and our clients to create um, a poor experience for you know for their fans because that reflects badly on all of us. So 4G was a bit of a watershed. Um, we pushed out our live stream for producers app, which is a really great app and enables you to stream um, you know in very high quality on 4G networks or through Wi-Fi. Um, and we're seeing, you know, a growing amount of content being produced from those applications, uh, from those applications, and from those devices. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, iPhone and Android we're on at the moment, looking at, you know, looking at Windows, looking at BlackBerry and stuff like that, but still focusing very much on those big two operating systems. And I think we'll begin to see as those networks, as those 4G networks, and you know, beyond 4G increase. Um, as I say, going back to the first question, the, the first thing to always think through is your internet connection and how you're going to get the content out there. As 4G improves, as the networks grow, um, as the quality and the speed of data upload and transfer increases, I think we'll see more and more producers using that as a, as a way to go live. Sure. And finally, just a, how do you, uh, what's your sort of best way of growing the, the user base when it comes to, to music users? Uh, you know, is there a specific way to draw them in, or you know, do you just do literally like one-to-one -one relationships and, and try and develop those uh, directly? Are you talking about from live streams perspective, yeah. or from people that are producing on our platform? Now, from live streams perspective, yeah. Um, growing our music base, I mean, it's really, you know, it's really working with the best talent that we can and as many music artists as we can. And I think we've made a big investment in the music space. Yeah. Um, certainly compared against you know a lot of our competitors so working as, with as many artists as we can creating the best tools possible uh, and the best free tools possible to you know enable artists to go live and then helping them re-engage their audience base um, I mean that's really you know that's really that's our growth strategy in music yeah. is yeah. trying to get in front of as many viewers as possible by working with as many good uh, good quality artists and providing tools for you know for the whole spectrum I mean, there are people out there we've seen over the last year or two, as I'm sure, you know, you and most of your readers um, and viewers are familiar, you know, YouTube have moved into the live space as well. And more and more, you know, Vivo just announced some additional, you know, live uh, TV content that they're going to be doing. I mean, there are some of the bigger players in the video space online moving more and more into live, but they're not producing the sorts of tools that enable, you know, um, smaller bands to be able to go live at low cost um, and with any sort of regularity. Um, that's what we're about. We're a technology platform, but we're also building out a suite of tools that enable, you know, any band from any walk of life, um, not just any band, obviously, but any producer from any walk of life to be able to go live 
in high quality, at low cost, and in a reliable fashion. And that's really our growth strategy in mobile, uh, in music, is try and work with as many music people as possible. They're bringing their audience to us, and you know we're hopefully helping them re-engage them every time they go live, and maybe turn them on to new content as well. Yeah, sure. And I, I just uh, to touch upon the live blogging uh, side of it, because that, that's, I think, really interesting for, for musicians and, and, and bands uh, to look at, just because uh, you know, there are things like Tumblr and, and, and all that, which, which are fantastic, but like, I, I really like the interface of the live blogging for live stream. And uh, is that catered to creators on that level, or is it more p p professional uh, uh, bloggers and, and that sort of, sort of people? No, I mean, our, uh, our live stream for producers app on the iPhone, for example, you can be taking, I mean, I'm lucky, I get to bring my dog into work every day with me, okay? Oh, nice. And sometimes I'll go live on my iPhone and start streaming her just, you know, sleeping by my desk or whatever, so my wife can tune in from work and watch her. Um, so while I'm streaming her live on my iPhone, I have the ability to take photos as well and take text updates and be pushing those through the same app at the same time. It's a pretty amazing experience and it's a pretty amazing tool. So my wife's watching, you know, our dog Ziggy on, you know, on my channel on live stream and I'm posting, you know, from the same application without interrupting the video. I'm posting photo updates, I'm posting text. So that's really available to anyone. Um, a very, very good case study I would recommend to any of your viewers um, is to go to our Jason Aldean um, live stream channel. We did a broadcast with him at the end of the year, which was really a, an awesome use, um, use study of our new mobile app, where we appreciate that you know, people are coming to live stream and coming to live video sites to watch live video events, obviously. But then there's a lot of content surrounding that that never sees the light of day on these platforms that is really useful to engage viewers and to engage fans in the run-up to the content, the live content itself, and beyond. And one of the bad, like the poor things that the live video space has done really historically is communicate um, in the run-up to a live event what's going on. It used to be a very like it used to be a very static experience, a static player sitting in a channel page, and maybe you would have a slate up there saying "come back at seven o'clock," but there's no incentive to you know to really to really come back and stay on that page. So with Jason Aldean as an example, and obviously he's one of the biggest country stars in the world right now. He did a uh, event at the tail end of last year. It was called the Night Train where he went around the US um, to a number of different markets, places like Boston, to announce live shows coming up the following year. And um, so, I mean, you know, big country star. He had a private jet to fly him around the country. Not many people have access to that. Yeah. But so he's flying to Boston. He's flying to a number of different markets, doing big announcements in each market for upcoming shows. And then that whole day of traveling around the US culminated in a big secret show in Georgia. Uh, where he basically crashed, I think it was the University of Georgia's homecoming parade and, you know, performed live to a bunch of students. And it was, you know, initially the contact with Jason and his team was about how can we stream this, you know, this show in Georgia. But then the more we talked to them, we were like, well, you've got all this content for 24 hours leading up to this show that your fans are going to want to tune in and watch. They're going to want to see Jason on the plane. They're going to want to see him at Wrigley Field in Boston. They're going to, you know, um, I might have just got the name of the Boston Stadium wrong, but whatever. Um, they're going to want to see all of this stuff, and it's a really great hook to keep, you know, for the 24 hours, whatever, prior to the live show, get as many viewers as possible tuning into the live stream channel page, following it, and then therefore coming back to watch the live show. So if you go to his channel page, you will see a host of content all the way leading up to the show. It's photos from his travels, it's text updates from Jason himself or from his management team saying, you know, next stop, City X. Um, and it really was the culmination and I think one of the best cases, you know, case studies we could hope to show of what we're trying to do with live blogging. But there is a lot of content leading up to live events that fans are interested in and that producers want to make available in the same place to try and hook viewers in and get as many people watching the live content as possible. So yeah, just go to livestream.com, do a search for Jason Aldina in the top bar and you can see, you know, really our live blogging tools as they were used in an ideal setting in action and that's what we hope more and more people to do. Great, well thanks so much for uh, being on the show, it was great having you on and I would recommend everybody to go and check out livestream.com, you can find uh, the rest of the coverage of Digital Music Trends at South by Southwest on digitalmusictrends.com slash SXSW. Thanks so much Matt. Thank you very much Andrew. Trend, 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 trend.